verses 66 through 69. John chapter 6, verses 66 through 69. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Good morning, church. What a beautiful day it is, 90 plus degrees. Welcome to summer. It's going to be upon us here in just a minute. First and foremost, what I'd like to do, it's already been mentioned, but if you are visiting with us this morning, you are truly our honored guest. We are thankful that you are here, but God is glorified that you are here, and that is more important than us being thankful. I wanted to mention that there were a few men that were able to attend the Chino men's breakfast yesterday. If you didn't get enough to eat yesterday, shame on you, because there was plenty of food. There were approximately 200 men of God in that room. I don't know about everybody else, but that is powerful to me, to have that many men of God in one location. The singing, ladies, you have beautiful voices, but the power of 200 men singing is unique. And I would encourage any of the men, if you're able to next year, this year was their 14th annual, so next year will be the 15th annual. So I would encourage any man it's in the first part of June every year to attend. Second, the hymn we just sung, The Glory Land Way. Are we truly in that glory land way? Are we walking a life that is in that glory land way? How we feel, what we do. The last verse, verse 3, onward I go rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. That's where we're all trying to get. It's a long road. Some of us have been on this road for a while. Some for a very short period of time. But we should be joyous. We should have glory that we are in him. What a blessing it is to be a child of God. Derek, thank you for the reading in John chapter 6. To whom shall we go? That is the lesson's title this morning. To whom shall we go? Think about the world around us. Think about the people we know and we love and we care about. Where do they go? Where do they go, and where should we go? Well, we're going to study this out. Our lesson is based on the question by Peter in verse, in verse 68, to whom shall we go? We will consider Peter's question in such a way so as to point out the number of special blessings that are only in the Lord Jesus and are only provided to his children if they are in him. And before we do so, let's rehearse some of the story. The situation that led to Peter to ask this question. Earlier on in chapter 6, we had Jesus feeding 5,000 people. It's a lot of folks to be following you. I've never had 5,000 people follow me. But I just imagine the magnitude of that crowd. And they were following him for a reason, to hear the words that he was speaking. 
So they had just witnessed him performing a miracle with five barley loaves and two fish. Well, I don't know about you, but if I saw anyone feed 5,000 people with five barley loaves and two fish, I'd be a little impressed. I'd be like, you know what? That's pretty good. I mean, my wife can stretch a meal, especially when we were on the short end. But she couldn't do five barley loaves and two fish in the feeding 5,000 people. So then the next day, Jesus identifies himself as the bread of life. Now, they had just eaten five, fed 5,000 people. They had been filled. They were filled so much, there was food left over. They had to pick it up, and they had to put it in baskets. So now we have the Christ, the day after this, identifying himself as the bread of life. And he talked about everlasting life. If you have your Bibles with you, and I pray that you do, if you do not, there should be a pew Bible in front of you. I would encourage you to open up your Bibles and follow along with me because we must always and only go to the Word of God and His Word only for our understanding. So in verse 35 of chapter 6, the Bible reads, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Continuing on to verse number 40 of that same chapter. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will rise him up at the last day. And then in verse 47 and 48, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And then in verse 58, again, this is Jesus still speaking. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats this bread will live forever. So, he just fed the 5,000, and then Jesus begins to speak to them about him being the bread of life. And if they eat of that bread, they will have everlasting life. According to verses 60 and 61, Many of the Lord's disciples found his comments to be challenging. So verse 60 and 61. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? We're talking about the inner circle here, his disciples. We're not talking about one of the random 5,000 people. We're talking about the men that walked with him, that slept with him, that ate with him on a daily basis. And it was hard for them to understand. Regardless, Jesus described his words as being spirit and life. In uh, the same chapter, verse number 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are Spirit, and they are life. Literally, the words that Jesus would speak were Spirit and life. 
Unfortunately, many of the Lord's disciples stopped following him. Verse number 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So you're being followed by a group of some 5,000 people. It doesn't tell us how many stopped walking with him. But as we continue on, we'll see who he asked a question, and that is the question that Peter answers. So, in verse 67, Jesus reacted to the disciples leaving by asking the 12. Again, that is the inner circle. Those are the men that Jesus himself picked. Come follow me. Come follow me. And they went and they followed him. So in verse 67, Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Imagine being asked that question by the Christ. Do you also want to go away? Think about... Rod mentions it many times. We've all experienced it. There are people that have obeyed the gospel. They are in Christ, and they go away for whatever reason. There's never a good reason, but they have reason. Will you also go away? And then we have Peter's response to Jesus in verse 68 and 69. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Question mark. Who, who are we going to go to? They've been walking by his side. Who could we possibly go to? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus is the Word, John chapter 1. We are sanctified by the truth, John 17, 17. His Word is truth. We are set apart by Christ, who is the Word. We have been reconciled. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to promote real quickly. If you're not here Sunday mornings beginning at 9.30 when Brother Rod does his Bible study, you're truly missing out. He spends a lot of time. He puts a lot of work into it. He has information that you can only grow as a Christian. I would encourage everybody, if you're not able to be here, try to find a way. Try to make it here because I promise you, you will be blessed in the Bible study. So, Peter basically asked, who else can we go to? Who else is there? Who else is around? Who am I going to go to? My neighbor? My parent? My brother? My sister? Who am I going to go to? You have the words to eternal life. Peter indicated that only Jesus has those words. Nobody else. Not Confucius. Not Muhammad. Name, name somebody. Nobody. Nobody has the words to eternal life save Christ Jesus. He and he alone has those words to eternal life. This implies that those who left Jesus gave up their hope of eternal life. Think about the ramifications of that. If only Jesus has the words of eternal life, and the people left those words of eternal life, then they're without the words of eternal life. And they are lost. And on that day of judgment, it will be a wake-up call. Peter was confident that Jesus is that Christ. Not a Christ, but the Christ. The Son of the living God. 
And we can read in other chapters in the Bible where Peter makes that confession. And, and Jesus says to him that it could only have been revealed to him by the Father. So to summarize, to whom shall we go for eternal life? We must go. We can only go to Jesus, the Son of God, who is the bread of life and who has the words of eternal life. No one else can provide everlasting life. Again, Jesus says, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. He is the door. You can't get through to the Father unless you come through Jesus Christ. That is the only way. It is one way. It is not many ways. We must do all that the Bible says one must do to be added to the church, to be added to the kingdom, to be added to the body. It's added to. It's not join. You can join all kinds of things. You can't join the church. You're added to the church. And Christ himself does the adding when you're obedient to the words which are written in the New Testament. So, that being said, what special blessings can only be found in Christ Jesus? And there are blessings beyond our ability to fathom. There are blessings on this side of heaven, but the ultimate blessing is heaven. To be with the Father, to be with the Son, to be with the Spirit in heaven. I can't even imagine what that will be like. We read in Revelation and it tries to describe in earthly words what heaven will look like and be like. I just think it'll be so much beyond whatever we could imagine that the words that are trying to describe it to us can't even begin to compare what it will be like. So, there are six special blessings that only the Lord provides. If you would, let's look at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 and verse number 10. I'm going to read 9 and 10. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He has come to save those that are lost. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 25. And again, Rod has just begun going through the book of Hebrews. We've only got to like verse 7. I encourage you to come next Sunday morning. Romans chapter 7 and verse number 25. Therefore he, the he there is, Jesus, is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Again, you have to go through Christ. Where did I leave off? Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Christ is making intercession, not just for us, but for those that will come to the Father through him. To whom shall we go for freedom? Who are we going to go to for freedom? We live in America. We consider this a free nation. Are we really free? Or does true freedom only come through Christ Jesus? Let's look at John chapter 8. Gospel of John and chapter number 8. Verses 
31 and 32. This is Jesus answering a question. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If we are seeking truth, God will reveal truth to you. He will bring truth to you either through an individual, through the study of his word, but I promise you, if you are truly seeking the truth, and there is but one truth, there is but one truth, and if you're truly seeking, if you're truly knocking, if you're truly praying for truth, God will make a way. And then John 8, verse number 36. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. We are either slaves of sin or we are slaves of righteousness. That is it. You're a slave of sin, which means that you're working on behalf of the devil, the evil one. Or you are a slave of God through his son, Christ Jesus. I don't know about everybody else, but I'd rather be a slave of God through Christ Jesus. To whom shall we go for peace? So first it was to whom shall we go for salvation? Then who shall we go to for freedom? Now who shall we go to for peace? If you would, John 14, chapter 14, and verse number 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The world is a brutal place. It is, it is just brutal. It'll beat you to the ground. It'll keep you there if you let it. But if you want to rise up, you need to rise up in Christ Jesus where he gives you that peace. Paul had been beaten and was in chains in prison, yet he had the peace in himself to sing praises unto God. If things turned around so drastically in America where we could be beaten and thrown into prison for our beliefs, I would pray that we would be able to sing while we're in prison. And his singing led to the obedience of the gospel, not just of the jailer, but of the jailer's entire household. We never know how our response to adverse situations is going to cause others to look and ask, how can this be? How can this individual handle what they're handling the way in which they're handling it? Because we have the peace that is only found in Christ Jesus. And then Ephesians chapter 2, this is still on peace. Ephesians 2. Verses 14 through 18. I'm just going to use the name Jesus where it says he. For Jesus himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Here it's speaking about the law and grace. He tore that wall down having abolished it in his flesh, the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body 
through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. That is what took place on that cross, at his death, at his burial, and at his resurrection. To whom shall we go for joy? Again, I'm not talking about being happy. We have a lot of friends that are happy. We have acquaintances that are happy. I'm talking about a joy. Deep down, deep down, deep down in my, right, with him? Deep. Happiness is like a surface thing. Joy is deep, or it ought to be deep. John chapter 15 and verse number 11. Gospel of John 15 and verse number 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy, literally Jesus' joy, may remain in you, in us, that our joy may be full. Our joy should, the, the cup should be running over. And if you don't have joy, it's the devil that is stealing it from you. And you need to tell the devil, just like Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You need to tell the devil to get behind you. If you resist the devil, he must flee from you. But the onus is on us to resist him. And if we're not resisting him, then he's attacking each and every one of us. To whom shall we go for rest? I was just speaking to one of the brothers that went to the breakfast with us yesterday and when I got home I told him I sat on the couch and before I knew it I was asleep. He told me that when he got home he got a phone call and he was out and about. He's tired. I don't blame him. What he did I'd have been tired. But you know what? He was here for Bible study. He wasn't that tired. You know why? Because I guarantee you being here builds him up. Being here encourages him. Being here gives him strength. Being here gives him purpose. We have to have a purpose. Let's look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Verse number 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 29 and 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you might find rest. No. You will find rest for your souls. Why is that, Jesus? For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You want rest, true rest? That is found in Christ Jesus. And then number six, to whom shall we go for companionship? Who are we going to go to for companionship. Let's look at Matthew 28 and verse 20. Matthew 28 and verse 20, the latter part of verse 20. I'm going to read the whole verse, but it's beginning really at I am with you always teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, here's what I want us to focus on, 
and I am with you. Jesus is with us always. If you're in Christ, Jesus will never leave you. Only you can leave him. Think about that. He never leaves us. We leave him. Just like we read in John chapter 6, a lot of his disciples stopped following him. One other passage, then the conclusion and the lesson is yours. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Again, it's the latter part of verse number 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. A lot of people say that I walk with Jesus. Technically, Jesus is walking before us. He ought to be walking before you. He certainly shouldn't be walking behind us. And if he goes before us, and he cares for us, and our peace is in him, why would we not follow the Christ who is leading us? We must follow him. We must avoid the mistakes made by the people that we read about in John 6, in verse number 66. By turning from the Lord, they lost their hope of eternal life. Sadly, again, there are many brothers and sisters that were in Christ who turned and left. For whatever reason, they turned and left. Let us follow the example of Peter and the other apostles because they didn't leave. They knew that eternal life is only available through Christ. That is the only place eternal life is available. No one else can provide it. No one, no thing, certainly no man. In addition to eternal life, Jesus is the only one who provides salvation, freedom, Peace, joy, rest, and companionship. So you ask yourself, well, how does one get into Christ where these blessings are? The Bible is as clear as it could possibly be. You have to hear his word, either being preached or you have to study it. If you hear it and you believe it, that's going to cause you to recognize that you're a sinner and you are not right with the creator of the universe. And when you realize that, you ask yourself, well, what do I have to do? I want to be right with the creator. All we have to do is do what they did in the first century, and you'll become what they were in the first century. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, the Bible said that they asked Peter, what must we do to be saved? Peter didn't respond, nothing. Just say this prayer. That's not what his response was. Peter's response was, repent. Turn back to God. Stop walking away from him. Stop resisting him. Realize your situation. Turn back to God and be baptized. Well, Peter, why do I have to be baptized? For or unto the remission of your sins. Our sins are washed away in the watery grave of baptism. You need to confess him. You need to confess that Jesus is the Christ. This is the only way somebody goes from death to life. It is the only way somebody goes from darkness to light. It is the only way you get into Christ Jesus. In the book of Romans, it says, as many of us as have been 
baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. That is where we come into contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. If there's anyone here this morning that would like to further study this out, or that would love to put Christ on in baptism, we encourage you, God commands you. If there's anyone here that needs the prayers, the help of the church, we ask you to come forward as we stand and as we sing. Just as I am.